affordable. It's yeah. far more affordable. You're, you're, you're saving so much money. He was aware of what I was doing. Uh, I told him, like, hey, look, I don't eat any plants. And I said, look, it helps me out, brings my focus back in. I don't have any OCD symptoms with it. My anxiety is far down. And I'm able to cope with a lot of stressors in life because of this. It's a lifesaver. Like, I'm just happy that that where I am now has not only gifted me the ability to like live a life that doesn't have the OCD anymore and doesn't have the anxiety tied to it and, and the depression because of all that. I'm thankful for because now I get to tell other people about it. Now I get to tell those that are suffering with OCD. There's a potential way out. Okay, good morning, folks. Happy Tuesday. We have uh, Travis here as our guest today. He's going to be sharing his uh, success stories. So. Perfect, perfect. Well, welcome, Travis. Where, where, are you, where are you located, Travis? I'm located in Canada, here in Calgary, Alberta. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, you know, it's kind of funny. I put up a, uh, a questionnaire about who had the best beef in the world, and I got a lot of Albertans saying Alberta has the best yeah. beef in the world. So uh, I've, been, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I've been there at least once. I've been to Calgary. I competed in a, in a Highland Games competition, uh, but God, this has been about uh, 10 years ago now, maybe even longer. Uh, and then went up to a place called Canmore, which I thought was quite, quite pretty. But anyway, well, welcome. Uh, welcome to, to the group. I guess I'll just let you start by telling Tell us your background. I saw you had a couple, several issues that you've been able to apparently improve via via changing nutrition. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's it's fair to say. Uh, let's get down to the beginning of it, I guess. Uh, so I had uh, I was born with a quotation of the aorta. Mm-hmm. Actually, I was born okay. uh, nearly three months premature, and and I had a lot of health complications because of that. Uh, I would say going down the road, I've had. Eight close to well, I'd say eight heart operations and two gastrointestinal because my aorta was actually plumbed to my stomach stomach artery. So because that got infected and it rode into my stomach, it was a, a very complex issue that had to be corrected. And yeah, altogether I've had probably close to ten operations to wow. correct all that. Wow. And and uh, there used to be like a trivia question in medical school. I remember coarctation of the aorta. So most people probably haven't haven't really heard of it. You know, it's it's basically it kind of narrows out quite a bit. And so, um, so had how you how old were you when you had surgery? Just a couple of years old, I imagine. Or oh yeah, yeah. It was like I think they found out someone's wrong. Maybe around when I was one and a half or two years old. Yeah, so yeah, pretty yeah. much on the point. Yeah. Okay. And did you have any lasting, I mean, you know, you hard to believe you wouldn't, but any, any kind of lasting difficulties growing up as a kid, any, any health issues from, from that, from then on? Or were you yeah. Well, yeah. Cause of develop, developmentally wise, uh, uh, my, I know femoral arteries or barely any femoral arteries, uh, in my legs. Uh, so I was definitely not able to do a lot of, uh, physical activities or at least if I was to, it was very limited. And of course, I had high blood pressure as well because I had narrowing of the arteries again because of the coarctation and the uh, procedures and the trauma to the body itself. So I had a lot of complications there, but I also had, as I was getting older, certain things were popping up. I had issues with my skin. I had headaches, migraines almost daily, right? My mom was always pulling me out of school because I had a headache and I had high blood pressure again, as I mentioned earlier, and I started to have severe mental issues uh, with OCD, anxiety, and depression, and uh, skin disorders like eczema and psoriasis. And it was all kind of eventually after I came to it, I I've came to the conclusion that it was diet related, that it was indeed diet related. So I just Eventually, I don't know how to say this. I started with paleo, right? Because I thought that was the best way to go uh, in order to correct a lot of this stuff that was going on. And I decided, okay, well, maybe keto is the best way because I hear a lot of people with uh, mental health issues going keto and and kind of putting a lot of that in remiss as as they go on a high fat diet and giving their brain an, an alternative fuel with ketones. And that was great and all, but I found out at least 
as I excluded more and more plants that I felt better. And I was very like, kind of, I was kind of scared, like thinking to myself, is this even healthy? Can I, can I actually do this sustainably and, and be okay at the end of this? And sure enough, I go on forums like Reddit and on Facebook and I'm looking up zero carb, right? There was no name for it at that time. So I'm looking up zero carb and sure enough, there's people that are asking the same questions, having the same worries. Is this safe? Is this, you know, sustainable? Can I survive doing this? And sure enough, I mean, there are people that that were doing it for years already. And yeah, like I, I just decided to myself or I said to myself, I, I should just give this a shot. Right. And, and if all the things clear up over time, then I've made the right choice. And sure enough, after a few months, I would say, uh, things started to clear up astronomically. Like my skin was better. My OCD was a complete remission and my health parameters across the board were amazing. Yeah, it sounds like a win to me, you know, I mean, it's kind of yeah. like, it's kind of like obvious, but we still have people saying, well, no, that's gotta be bad for you. And you shouldn't do that because, because we're worried about something, something cholesterol or something along those lines. Yeah. I'm just, I'm curious. Cause you said you had no femoral arteries, which I, I I'm confused by that statement because I think you wouldn't have oh, any yeah. legs. Okay. Would, so cause co- I wouldn't say no, but it's like an exaggeration. But like when I went in for a, uh, it was a scan of sorts, they were looking to see where they could use a bypass, right? For the, for correct and yeah. and typically they would use uh, an artery in the leg or something to, to kind of subside or subsist, but they couldn't use it because it was too narrow, it's too small. So the point is that every time I have a complex surgical procedure, such as what I went through, they're scared or worried that by the end of it I won't be able to walk. Mm. Like that's how that it is. And I'm not sure about the the technicalities of it. I'm not real. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a surgeon, but that's one of the things they worry about. And when I wake up from one of these operations, the first thing they're checking is my ability to move my legs. Yeah. Strange enough. Yeah. So for, for what it is, yeah, it's a, I have a issue with my femoral arteries in my legs, Interesting, yeah. but I walk fine for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. So, it'd be like, you know, because typically when they do like heart bypass grafts, when they're fixing a the coronary arteries, they'll take something called like the saphenous vein, which is a vein in your in your calf, or sometimes they'll take the radial artery out of your forearm. You know, sometimes they use a little, sometimes use a called an internal mammary artery, which is an artery runs the inside of your, your chest wall. But, um, but the aorta is a much bigger vessel. So I, you, maybe they, maybe they do a segment of femoral artery for that. I'm not sure. So they'd have to reanastomose it again, but interesting. Well, I'm glad you're, you're doing okay from that. Uh, what, how you said when you had multiple, how, how was, how old were you when you had your last surgery? Did you just have it all when you were a little kid or was it, does it? I uh, no, my last one was, I think maybe four, four and a half years ago. What, and what was that to do? I, I had an aneurysm uh, and the, cause they, the graph that they, placed inside me that they plumbed up my stomach artery up to my heart was starting to give out. I see. Okay. Uh, it was a pickle, the aorta. And so it just wasn't lasting. It was and, a, what kind of aorta was it? You said, yeah, they call it a pickled one. It was a, pickled. they basically uh, put a bunch of cells or stem cells on it to, mm-hmm. to kind of reinvigorate it. And they put it in me and they've never done like anything like this before. And sure enough, it's it wasn't meant to last. Okay. So they started putting stents all the way through it. Where did they get that graft from? Was it was it something they was it, it was it an allograft? Was it from some something else, like an animal or another person? I think it was a donor. I think it was so an actual okay. person. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So cataveric graft. Okay. Um, any? Did you have to be on medications, anti rejection medications for that, or no? Long term wise, they put me on antibiotics. Actually, yeah. Okay. Um, but what I found is that when going carnivore, that reduced the amount, obviously reduced the amount of carbohydrates coming in and therefore exogenous amounts of glucose and therefore lowering your serum glucose considerably, right? So uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but when it comes to seeking out infections, right, like let's say on a graft or what have you, they use irradiated glucose to trace it, right? 
uh, similar to what they do with cancer, I imagine. And so that kind of clicked for me. I was like, well, if they use glucose to find an infection, then wouldn't it be best for someone that has a high risk of infection to be on a low glycemic diet or even a, a zero <laughs> glycemic diet? That's that's what I did. And ultimately, instead of taking a antibiotic daily, I take one once every few weeks, if, if maybe once every couple of months. It's like it's it's a lifesaver. It really is because I've I've had uh, two heart infections that were pretty bad, but uh, yeah, it was it was a lifesaver. It really helped out, and I, I hope in the future that there's therapeutics or or things that people can do or doctors can uh, prescribe to say, hey, maybe you should change your diet to make this a less less of a hectic issue for you or down the path or down the future. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, clearly diabetics suffer from higher infection rates and, and the high glucose environment it helps to make you know, some of the bacteria particularly like that. So certainly, you know, you can see a benefit from from reducing that. I'm, I'm you know, uh, Remind me the timeline of this because you're looking around and, and, you know, when, again, I started into this about, I'd say about eight years ago now, I started realizing there were people doing these no carb, they call it zero carb diets. Uh, back, you know, I guess it was about two, 2015 or something when I first discovered this and then subsequently went on to kind of redub it, the carnivore diet, so on, so on and so forth. But so how long ago was it you were, we were learning about this stuff? Well, again, I've been essentially i guess you call it carnivore but uh, i've been carnivore for close to eight years yeah. uh, it was like a trial by fire thing like I, I i would go on it for a few months and i would consume a little bit of fruit or whatever and i'd always find myself going back to it and again i was i was worried that that this was a sustainable thing and at that time yeah like you said it was there was no it wasn't called carnivore it was zero carb yep. or or low carb, right? Or keto without plants. Yeah. I, I, I'd say about eight years I've been doing this. Yeah. So, so you've sort of answered the question about sustainability for yourself, I assume at this point, is that fair to say? Yeah. 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 And you know, like I said, I'm now, this is my seventh year of doing this and I'm, I'm pretty convinced. Uh, and there's many people in here that have been doing it several years. There's, and obviously, you know, there's people been doing this 20 plus years, you know, reportedly people doing it 50 plus years. So, I think the sustainability question is certainly doable. You know, well, there's complete cultures that have been doing it for you know, their whole lives. Right. Well, so. arguably, yeah, depending on some people say well, I had, you know, some of the you know had a few berries in the summer and occasionally things like that. But yeah, generally, I mean we've got whole societies that have been almost exclusively meat based for millennia. So so you're up in Alberta with the great Alberta beef, you know. <laughs> Mm. Barley fu- barley finish is typically what they they like to use up in Alberta. What do you eat? My go to for a lot of my meals is ground beef and egg yolks. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like every morning and it never, I never get tired of it. Yeah. Like I'm never sick of it. And it tastes, it always tastes great. In fact, some days it tastes better than others, but it always tastes great. It just depends on how. And, and I look at, I look at food as much as I look at like, you know, brushing your teeth in the morning or having a shower. It's not something you necessarily want to do, but it's something you have to do. Right. And it makes you feel good at the end. And with beef, if I don't feel like I'm all that hungry, I think to myself, yeah, but do I want to feel good today? Ground beef is one of my go-tos. I don't mind steak, but I don't I don't mind uh steak. Uh I just find ground beef to to be very malleable and, and you can do a lot of things with it. So yeah. some days I want it to be crispy, some days I want it to be a little bit raw, some days, you know, it's it's really easy for me. Yeah. Good for you. That, and, and that is, uh, you know, like I, uh, it is, you know, you think about it, you know, I mean, we've got so many choices these days. I mean, there, I mean, there's an almost an infinite amount of food flavors and varieties that all of us have access to, uh, at least, mm. at least in, you know, in a, in a developed country. Uh, and you know, it, it didn't always used to be that way. I mean, there, there, there's a long period of time where, you know, you didn't have that much to choose from. And now we're like, we feel depressed. How can you not, how can you put you know, stay off of the donuts and the cookies and the cakes and the candies and the potato chips and the 57 flavors of soda. And, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, at some point it's an overload and, you know, it, it, it's sometimes so nice to simplify it. And I'm the same way. I just, 
I look forward to every single meal. I never, I, I never feel bad that I, I'm eating, you know, meat every day. I'm just like, God, I'm, I'm feel, I feel quite honestly, I feel very lucky that I'm able to do that. And, um, and, and I, and I think that's a really good point. How do I want to feel today? And that's, you know, when we're thinking about our nutrition, do I want to have a day where I feel really good or do I not? And if we, if we thought about that before we ate stuff, I think it would maybe change what a lot of us choose to eat. But so you've been doing this for, you know, now eight years, obviously you just had, you had surgery four years ago. So you're, you're still in, in and out of the, the healthcare profession up there in Canada and their national health service or whatever they call it. Are any of the physicians or healthcare providers that you work with aware of what you're doing dietary wise? And do they say anything or care? Or? Yeah. I, I had a family doctor had because he did move to BC. So I had to find another one, but he was aware of what I was doing. Uh, I told him like, Hey, look, I don't eat any plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I said that is because he was asking about probiotics, right? Because I was taking antibiotics and, and all that stuff. And uh, he said, are you taking any prebiotics, taking any fiber? I was like, no, I, I don't consume any plants. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he was kind of struck by that, like a little curious about it. And I said, look, it helps me out. It, it brings my focus back in. I, I don't have any OCD symptoms with it. My anxiety is is far down and I'm able to cope with a lot of stressors in life because of this. And I've been through a lot of stress. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a lifesaver, like I said, and I, I'm, I'm very thankful. I'm very, I'm hopeful too, because as, as I've been on this journey and I've been able to tell people about it, a lot of people have been helped because of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, it's yeah, sky's the limit when it comes to carnivore. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's I, I always, you know, like I said, that's why I think it's so important for these, for everybody to share their different individual stories because it does help. You know, it, you know, yeah, it's great that it's helped you, but you, you a lot of somebody's going to hear this and and you know, and, and so let's just kind of review. So you had psoriasis. Uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. You did say you had psoriasis. Is that right? Yes. So psoriasis, autoimmune disease. Uh, I think there's some relationship between gut health and that. Uh, how how extensive was it? How long did you have it for? And how long did it take to go away? And is it completely gone now? Well, it wasn't it wasn't too extensive, right? But it was happening on my face, mm -hmm. and that is a very like you know like if you're self conscious and right. you're worried about like right. what's going on, then it, it it can you know it can make you feel very bad about yourself, right? So that being said, luckily it it, it started happening early in my carnivore days, like just before going carnivore. And I think dairy was a big culprit of it, strange enough. I mean, I know for a lot of people, dairy, cheese is okay on carnivore and a lot of people tolerate just fine. But for myself, uh, dairy was a, is a no-go. I can't, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, psoriasis and eczema will kind of flare up. So... And you were, how are you diagnosed with psoriasis? Did you go to doctor say, hey, well, my, fa my family doctor. Got yeah. It. Okay. What did they do? Before he, before he jumped ship, that is. Okay. And what, and did he have a treatment plan for you for the psoriasis? Uh, steroid creams. And I think I still have some downstairs actually, but yeah, uh, some steroid creams, uh, lotions. And he did suggest dietary, you know, like he's telling me not to go on or not to have tomatoes and and like nightshades and that sort of thing but, but ultimately it was it was carnivore that kind of helps get rid of it yeah how long did it take i wish i took i wish i took pictures because i didn't know that carnivore was going to do this for me like yeah. i wish it took me four pictures but yeah. like it's just something that happened so how long do you think it took to to resolve the psoriasis that you had on your face well because it wasn't like again it was right near the beginning of going on carnivore that i would say maybe a month or a little bit over than that, but yeah, about a month and a half, maybe. Okay. And then the OCD, how did that affect you when you had it? I mean, cause you said you're over it now. What, what were the kind of things that you, a lot of people have oh, compulsive gosh. hand washing and there's all kinds of different yeah. compulsions people. So have. I, I had, I had like intrusive thoughts, mm -hmm. like all day, every day, anxiety was horrible and intolerable to the point where like I actually I did submit myself to a, a ward for a few weeks. It was that bad because I was scared to, like, to take my own life. It was that bad because I, I saw no end, right? It was torture. It was everyday torture. 
and I couldn't sleep. I couldn't live a life and be awake for it. I didn't want to be awake for it because, again, it was 24-7, ruminating thoughts uh, and just horrible thoughts, right? Incongruent to who I was. Yeah, it was, it was horrible. And I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. To be honest, were you, uh, you know, because you know, you wonder about, you know, obviously now we see that a, a dietary change actually fixes. So you'd you'd say, well, maybe it, there was a dietary cause, but at the same time, you, you went through all these operations as a kid. You know, you're worried about your aorta exploding or something. I mean, you know, I mean, I can imagine where you're just like, I've got this fragility potentially or potential for something bad to happen. What, um, you know, as you you said, you were you were you were, you were hospitalized for this. Were you treated with medications as well? Were there medications like mood stabilizing things, or what did they put? Oh uh, yeah, I had they gave they, they gave me an SSRI. I can't remember the exact name of it, yeah. but it's basically trial and error for them, right? They mm-hmm. they give you one SSRI, and if that doesn't work out, they up the dose, and if that doesn't work out, then they change the SSRI, and it's really a gamble. And I'm just happy that that where I am now has not only gifted me the ability to like live a life that doesn't have the OCD anymore and doesn't have the anxiety tied to it and and the depression because of all that. But it also, it's I'm thankful for because now I get to tell other people about it. Now I get to tell those that are suffering with OCD that there's a way out. There's a potential way out. I'm not saying that, you know, one size fits all, but it's a miracle in my case. I'd be, I'd be quite selfish if I didn't tell someone or anyone that there's, you know, a potential or a possible treatment and it's completely dietary related. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, and this is, and maybe I'm, maybe you're aware of this, but Canada has this MAID program, medical assistance and dying <laughs> program, and they're extending it to people with mental health disorders. You know, like I mean, yeah. you know, I could see, you know, like, they like, well, you're sad. Have you thought about letting us kill you type of thing? Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, for some of the, I, I, I generally believe probably some of the people that probably in that, you know, particularly with, with mental health, probably a, a simple dietary shift could dramatically change uh, what they're doing or what's going on for them. And I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of uh, in my mind. Anyway, I think it's a crazy, crazy topic that's going on with that. But that, but um, here's the thing, because I was really bad with my OCD, right? To the point that I admitted myself to a psych ward. Now, imagine if Maid was around at that time. Mm-hmm. I'm suicidal. I admit myself to a psych ward. What would have happened if if there was a, I don't know, a nurse or some kind of advocate for Maid coming into the ward saying, hey, you know what? These medications are working for you, but there is a way out. Yeah. And it's Maid. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, it's kind of a scary so I, I, it's a scare. Yeah. I think I think I saw their clarification earlier. They wouldn't extend that to suicidal people. But I mean, you know, let's say let's say you weren't actively suicidal at the time, and you said, you know, I just I'm miserable. My life is not good. And they said, well, here here's a way out for you. But and and it's you know saving us healthcare dollars and all. That. It's it's kind of really dystopian. But gl- first of all, I'm glad you found something that worked for you. And you know, like I said, this is something that you know. I, this is one of my missions in life is to to get this out there as a treatment option for as many people around the world as possible, because, you know, there's, I mean, even if you don't do it the rest of your life, it's, it's like, it can heal people um, to the point where they can, you know, like you said, I mean, I, how would you rate your quality of life? I don't know, 15 years ago versus today. I mean, where, where, where would you, what would you change? How'd you characterize a change? Night and day, dude. Night, like night and day. I would say I was functioning like at a 30% and now I'm like, off the charts. I'm I'm beyond 100. percent I I feel like there's still room for improvement, and and I don't even know what that limit is. Not only am I a hundred bucks, but I feel super powered. If that makes any sense, like the focus, the the drive, the ambition. I was in a bad place. So, yeah, I think somewhere I was reading a little bit about your biography. Uh, you know, a little snippet for for this. I think I saw something about some glucose mal, you know, dysregulation, or were you having issues with glucose problems as well? Sometime in here. Yeah, yeah, I had some, uh, some. I guess they call it insulin resistance, but there's some criticism against that notion. But uh, yeah, yeah, I if I didn't eat 
halfway in the day or whatever, I would start to get my headaches, right? I would start to feel very tired and lethargic and unfocused and, you know, irritable. These are things that I dealt with every day. And I think a lot of people deal with every day and going carnivore kind of corrected that. So you just mentioned early on that you kind of were, you were unsure if it was sustainable. So you were kind of in and out because you weren't, you know, you were kind of afraid to, to do it long term. Mm -hmm. When you were, you know, could you tell a difference between when you were doing it and when you were not doing it? And did it, did it reactivate oh, some of the symptoms or how did it go? Yeah. So I would say definitely the, uh, uh, what I just mentioned earlier with the, you know, being lethargic and tired and, and irritable, that, that was definitely like a, a more of an onset thing. Every time I would go back to eating, you know, fruits or, or carbs or whatever. So that was one thing. And I felt like, uh, again, I was less ambitious. So I was not doing my workouts as I was do I would, uh, as I would do daily. And so that took a hit as well. And I felt like my ambitions were, were also taking a hit. Like it just felt like I was on a drug. I think a lot of people say that where like, when you do consume a lot of glucose, you feel like you're actually high, like you're on a drug and you're not really functioning. Yeah. I mean, some people would argue that, you know, some people would say sugar has drug-like effects for them, you know, and it's a controversial yeah. topic, but certainly it has physiologic effects. There's no doubt about that. At what point did you decide, hey, this is it, this is this is sustainable for me? How long did it take you to decide that, hey, I can do this for a long period of time? Yeah, I think it was I think it was like halfway in my journey, maybe close to four and a half years ago, where it was like, Yeah, I can't deviate. I can't go anywhere outside of this. Otherwise, my life just takes a, a massive hit, right? And I want to do a lot of things with my life. I have a lot of dreams and and goals. Mm -hmm. So in order to achieve that, I need to be in my best performance, right? Because there I mean there are people that do a very strict carnivore diet. And I'm I'm I, I like I said, I think they should be supported and I'm you know and I'm one of them for the most part, you know, with very rare mm -hmm. sort of exceptions. And there are folks that that are out there saying, well, you can't do carnivore. You need to add, you know, this and that fruits and things like that. But I mean, for you, that's a bad idea. Correct. Is that fair to say? Correct. Yeah. I've seen that. We've seen that. We seem to see that popping up a lot of times because, you know, with, with the history of mental health issues, you know, the, the, the OCD, uh, the presumably the autoimmune related issues like psoriasis, and then you've got this congenital issue. How is your aorta doing these days? I mean, how often do you get it checked up? I mean, is there is there anything that that gives you any kind of sense of assurance that, that things are working okay? I get well. I do it once a year, right? I go to my heart specialist, and then they set me up with a all these different scans and tests and stress tests. And for the time being, everything seems to be copacetic. Mm -hmm. Everything's good. Uh, I did get a calcium score test done a few years ago, and it was at a zero. Yeah, so old, that's yeah. good. How old are um, you? Just how old are you? Just for just for reference. I'm I'm 38. 38. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just but yeah. Uh, things, yeah. I'm sorry, just saying it's the calcium test. I would expect it to be zero for most people at 38. Just to be fair, because that's you know. You're, but I mean, again, you're eating. Yeah. You're high eating. risk though. I was a high risk. That's why I did it. Right. Right. Like, okay. High, high yeah. risk because of, because of your diet and your cholesterol or what, what was a high risk call? Oh no. Just my heart, like my history of my heart complications. I thought like maybe if I got that checked out, I would have more certainty and I'd feel more comfortable, uh -huh. not just with eating carnivore, but like with, with my history as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know. Maybe core, I don't know if correctation, which is additional risk for atherosclerotic sclerotic heart disease. I suspect maybe yeah. not, but, and, and just to, just because while we're on that topic, has your cholesterol been relatively high or is, where does it run relative to the standard normal? Uh, my LDL uh, runs a little bit low, like not low, but like regular, my HDL is a bit high, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not concerned about that. My triglycerides are up and down. Like the last time I got checked, it was, it was low, but before that it was a little bit high. I'm not sure. Maybe you can help me with this, but triglycerides are more of a, like more, more or less for carrying energy, correct? Or I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Well, I mean the triglyceride, you know, I mean, it, and, and some people disagree with this, but you know, higher triglycerides are again, another risk, considered a risk factor for heart disease. They may have 
a higher thrombogenic potential. So they, you know, they, there's some thought that blood clotting and something like that. But you have to remember with triglycerides, they're very much dependent upon when you last ate. And so one of the things I tell people on a carnivore diet is um, it probably takes us about 18 hours to be in a fasted state, particularly if you eat a big old, you know, big old meal, you know, 12 hours, 12 hours before your fasting number. It may not be through your system yet. And so you may still be putting that. So we can't. So if you don't, if you get a non fasting triglyceride number, it's almost, you know, it's, you can't really make much out of that. So, and the other thing is, you know, they, they do vary up and down. You know, you can take it two days in a row and they're going to get a different number and sometimes quite a bit different. So, yeah, it's like a snapshot, right? It's not really indicative of your normal levels throughout the day. It's just well, one moment. Yeah, well, right. I mean, it is one moment. It certainly can certainly is subject to variability, you know, even within the day. So it's hard to say for sure on that. But I think, like I said, that's why I think the imaging tends to be more helpful. But, you know, like I said, it would be, you know, maybe repeat it in five years and, you know, maybe every once every decade or something like that, you can check it to see. But I mean, you know, I mean, it, it sounds like, irrespective of what that ha what happens with that. I mean, you, you're, you, you don't want to leave this diet because bad things happen to you. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Again, almost noticeably with it, within a day. And I mean this in the sense that like, if I have like a day where I had a lot of fruits or an evening when I had a lot of fruits or whatever, I would know that the following night I'd have to sleep twice as long and even when I wake up, I'll feel groggy and and out of sorts, right? So it, it was a it was a quick lesson where I was just like, yeah, I can't do that. I can't do it. Yeah. Not even for not even one day. Not even a cheat day. Just can't do it. Yeah, there's people that will say that's I don't believe that. And how can fruit be bad? And you know, it's natural and blah blah blah. Yeah. And you know, it's like I said, I you know, I'm I'm, I'm out here saying, hey, it's. It, I believe these folks, you know, I can't, why would I, why, why would you have a reason to make that up? I mean, if you, you know, if you could eat it and it would be, pro wouldn't be problematic, you probably would and be like, Hey, okay, it's no big deal. I'll eat it. Right. And I think that's, that's fair to say, but you know, you find what works for you earlier on, maybe your, your wife, partner, whoever's in the room with you, how are they doing with your diet? I mean, I guess obviously they've had to have accepted it. Right. I, I would assume. Well, they, she's accepted it, but uh, she's also like very catering to it. I, I, I cook a lot of this, house, right? But when we go out for like dinners and stuff, she will grill the waiters to like, is there, there's no seed oils? Is it only meat? What do you fry with? Like she's doing all that, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I find that's very supportive. Yeah, it's really supportive. So she's looking out for you. So good. And I mean, I guess, you know, cause she like probably, you know, our spouses, you know, whatever, get to see a side of us that most people don't see. And when you're hurting in pain, miserable, you know, whatever, mentally not there, they're going to be dramatically impacted. So, I mean, obviously she knows that, you know, this is right for you. I assume does she, uh, does the rest of the, I mean, I don't know if you have any kid, kids or anything like that, but I mean, uh, how's the rest of the family's diet? Is everybody on well, a similar page? Or no? I have, I have a 14 year old boy, okay. uh, just the one. And I have two adopted sons as well, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not, they're not here with us yet, but they will be soon. And with my son, he eats mostly meat. Every morning, I make sure he has two egg yolks because I know there's a, a huge growth factor when it comes to consuming egg yolks during developmental stages and and especially with when it comes to his, his mental faculties. So I, I make sure he has that every day. But that being said, I'm not I'm not uh, a meat Nazi, if, if it were. I do allow my son to to dabble in with fruits every year here and there, but I'm very well uh, aware of the hybridization and the the amount of breeding that went into fruit to make it as sweet and as highly palatable as it is today. So when it comes to lower glycemic fruits, that's what I typically give my son. Uh, but for the most part, the bulk of his calories are from meat. Mm. How does he like it? Loves it. Yeah. How's, it. how's he doing? Pretty healthy kid? Uh, very, very active. Uh, he, he plays soccer, uh, does uh, winter skiing out uh, through the winter. And uh, he uh, does, he's a drummer as well. He plays guitar, very intelligent, hyper intelligent. I think because of what my son has been doing the last few years, and, and he loves it because when he wakes up, he's not groggy, he's not tired when he's going to school. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids have that. Yeah. They wake up and 
and they don't feel like they want to go to school because of it. Like they feel like because they haven't had enough rest and that their mental faculties aren't all there, that school just doesn't feel appealing to them. But with my son, because he feels well rested, school is is just another part of the day and he loves it. Yeah. Good for him. That's good for him. Good for you guys. That's nice when your kiddos are healthy and happy because it, you know, obviously when they're not, it's, it's, it, 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 it worries you. you. You said you occasionally take an antibiotic. Are you off all, I mean, how many medications were you on at one point and, and where are you at now with that? Well, I, like I said, I take one antibiotic once every two or three months. And it's only if I start feeling like there's some kind of infection going, like I have a, a seasonal uh, inflammation that happens with my sternum uh, because of the trauma that's happened with my sternum. Like they've cut it open several times. Right. Yeah. And, and it seems like almost every winter or the beginning of summer, there's some inflammation that goes on and it's never kind of went away. Like it just happens for a week or two and then it's gone. Right? Mm. But because it's, it feels so familiar to, to what an aneurysm feels like or an infection feels like that when it does happen, I have to A, go to the hospital and make sure it's not an aneurysm and B, take an antibiotic to make sure it's not an infection, right? So every time a seasonal change occurs, that's when I take those uh, precautionaries or, or those uh, prophylactic 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 there you go yes so i mean i guess because you've had a number we call sternotomies where your chest was split open and then they sew it back together with wires and they take it out again and put it together again multiple times uh throughout your life i'm assuming i mean that puts you at risk for infection was there ever an actual infection in your chest wall that they that they identified you know sometimes they'll have a little residual Uh, yeah like they they would do a scan and there was like a clouding around the aorta and this run the first time i had an infection i've had two infections two graft infections got it uh and if, if nobody knows about this a graft infection has a like a 50 percent risk of fatality yeah. right like coming out of it is very rare in a lot of cases uh but thankfully again thanks to carnivore and thanks to being on a zero carb diet that that wasn't the case for me right the risk factor just wasn't there yeah good for you yeah that's uh, yeah because i yeah, can imagine your aortic graft gets infected it could you know, because if it traumatically ruptures, you're basically like dead. I mean, it's like you know, it's yeah, not, it's not good. So that's that's a that's an issue. Are you, any limitations placed on you by the physicians with the with the graft in place? They can't exercise, or do they say do whatever you want to do, or what, what do they say? <laughs> that used to be that used to be the case. Doctors would tell me, "Hey, you shouldn't do this. Uh, you should limit yourself." But because of the exercise and because of the the weights I would, I would lift daily, I think, uh, five days a week, sometimes six days a week, that because of that, I was able to expand a lot of the aortics and, and, and I guess the arteries rather, and make things more, it was able to cope with a lot of the, the, the trauma, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if there's a blood flow is easier to go around the body, right? In theory, then things are lost, less stressed with the cardiovascular system. So they used to be against it, but now they're for it, right? Because even my femoral arteries have increased in in size since I started working out. So it like, pre- it pressured an adaptation if it were. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, we see that. I mean, we see that with the heart wall getting thicker. We see maybe, I suspect the intima, sort of the medial layer, the, the, the muscular layer, the arteries probably respond to some of that's away, and so you can have uh, some adaptations that occur. And we have things like neovascularization, where new blood vessels will form. So, so the, 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 the vascular system is somewhat plastic. So, good for you that you're you're able to do that. Are you? I didn't ask you that. Are you? Do you do you work? Are you able to work? Yeah, I actually have two jobs, and I'm starting a a business as well. Or but technically, I have started it. So, like I said, I'm, I'm very driven. I'm very ambitious. I have lots of goals, and Carnivore has helped me reach it. Good for you. That's awesome. Like I said, you 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 could go from a a you know, non productive member of society that you know is dependent upon the healthcare system, you know, hospitalized frequently, and you know that type of stuff to to, to you know, like you said, 
biz, multiple businesses and, and all these goals. What, has people known you for years, like even before, and, and have noticed a transition or tra- a change that, you know, maybe work coworkers and things like that? I would say not so much coworkers, even though they, they think I look a lot younger than, than I actually am. And so for that, they definitely ask a lot of questions, but I've had friends and relatives that have seen a massive change over the years. It's interesting because a lot of them will always come back to me and ask me, you know, are you still doing it? Have you noticed any other changes, you know, physiologically? It's it's very interesting to, to do this. And throughout the years, you just have people come out of the woodwork that you used to talk to, like back at school or whatever. They just have curiosity and I love it. Have you been able to influence some people like, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. locally oh, yeah. oh, to, yeah. to try this? Yes. Uh, too many to count. Because it's like, it's like proselytizing. Like the moment they see you only eating meat at the break room or whatever, yeah. right? It's like an opportunity to just tell them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, people people get a little curious when they see you just sit down to a big old pound of meat and nothing else. And, you know, they start to notice that after a period of time. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure that the, the comments are, you know, when you're going to have a heart attack, you know, how's your cholesterol, <laughs> you know, this sort of stuff, so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, I mean, you just kind of say, hey, look, this is what this is what makes me healthy. You know, and, and I think it's fair enough. Yeah. How, uh, so you said ground beef and eggs pretty much every day. How, uh, you know, because a lot of people say this diet is unaffordable. You know, we can't do it. It's too expensive. How have you found with that? I mean, you, I mean, can you compare what, what it costs now to, oh, you to eat it's, relative it's, to what it was It's years far ago? more affordable. It's yeah. far more affordable. Uh, like, because you're getting rid of all the other stuff, right? Right. I mean, and then you're able to sequester all your funds to meet. I think that's far more affordable. In fact, it is. Yeah. I mean, if you do the math, if you're buying junk food every, you know, every day and you're, mm-hmm. or you're buying fruits or you're buying grains and, and basically all these other plants, right. And you exclude those all of a sudden you're, you're, you're saving so much money and not only that, but there's always meat on sale, right. We have a store here. At, uh, it's called Superstore, right. And, and in often case, they have 30% off meat and you can buy that. And of course, it's like a, it's like a day where it goes bad, but put it in the freezer. Fine. Put it in the freezer. And it's, I mean, there's always sales at butchers, at grocery stores. There's always something, right? And like I said, you save a lot of money giving up all the rest of this stuff. Uh, it's a no brainer. At least, at least for now until they price us out of it. But Right now, it's a, it's a lot cheaper. Well, let's 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 delve into that a little bit. Let, let's say that you know there's people out there that want to uh, save the planet from cow farts from from boiling the oceans, and they want to they want to either make it so expensive or put a ration on that where you know hey you're only allowed to have one pound of beef a week or something like some 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 sort of nonsense scheme. Which which you know, there's people that would very much push for that. How would that impact you? Jeez, I would I would round up my family and purchase land on the boonies and start a farm. I, and that worries me too, right? We got these 15 minute cities and all that stuff. And I'm wondering how, how is that going to play out? And, and are they going to eventually price us out purposely? So to, so that we can't eat our meat and we can't live a comfortable and, and a productive life. Right. I mean, and it sounds counterintuitive because when they want people that can function optimally and and work for them, right? But it seems like no, they're they're okay with people suffering, and and that's a scary future if, if that's the future that's going to happen. Yeah, I think I think it's something we all have to push back against and, and do what we need to do to make sure it doesn't happen that way. So support the local ranchers, you know, continue to buy me, continue to let people know about how important it is to all of us because I think it is. You know, there's people out there that, you know, maybe they're young and they haven't suffered and they don't know what disease is like and they're trying to make policy, you know, or, or direct policy. And we're like, hey, wait a minute, you're, yeah. you're actually yeah. causing people. And and you are. I mean, you know, like I said, I, you'd have to be naive to think that these big corporations actually care about how happy you are. They don't really care. They care how much profit they make. And so. Uh, 
you, you know, you said you shared this and made people laugh. Are you, do you do any social media type stuff? Are you on social media talking about this stuff at all or no? Oh yeah. Yeah. I have, uh, I have my own website. Uh, it's sherelf.ca. Uh, I have a page, a couple pages on Facebook. Okay. Um, one on Instagram as well. Uh, I'm very active when it comes to promoting a carnivore based diet. Also, I, I, I have a business that, uh, promotes it as well. Um, I do a little coaching here and there. And also we're, we're launching a, a proprietary blend of meats that have organ meats and mm -hmm. and muscle meat blended in with one another. And, and hopefully we can market that in the future, but those are things that are happening as we, as we speak. So uh, who knows in the future, it could be uh, so many other things. And again, like I said, I have lots of goals. I have lots of dreams and, and ambitions that I want to, get done in this lifetime and pass on to my kids and and not just pass that on but pass on the information that comes along with it right so yeah i mean it's it's kind of a shame a lot of kids these days well not even these days in my time even don't even know how to cook there's people that grown men that i run to so they've never cooked a steak and i'm like you got to be kidding me you know it's just it's almost yeah, embarrassing yeah. but so in that time on social media has your reception been good or, I mean, I mean, cause, and, and I will say by and large mine has, and I've been fairly prominent talking about this stuff, um, by and large, 99% of the stuff I get is, 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 is generally good. There, there are some people that the quote unquote haters that are out there, you know, trying to, you know, whatever, just trying to say you're, you're bad for what you do or something like that. Do you get much of that? Has there been anybody like negative towards you? I think. I've had a couple instances where, you know, vegans came up and said, look, I'm a homeopath and herbs help and, and all this other nonsense. Uh, I think the only recent thing that's happened. And again, like yourself, I think 90%, 99% of the interactions that I have are very positive. Um, but like every now and then, and it's, I don't know why, but I get accused of taking steroids, which I mean, <laughs> Given my history, I would not be able to do that. I just, I can't risk it. But uh, no, I get accused of that, which I, I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm not someone that, I'm not that kind of guy. But uh, yeah, I get, you know, every now and then by a vegan, there's someone that comes across and says, you know, meat's bad and what about cholesterol and HDL and LDL and all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, I think it's typical for a lot of carnivores to go through that. But I mean, it's for the, for the most part, it's been pretty good. Yeah, good for you. Remind me, what was the name? Because I, I didn't really catch the name of your 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 website or your Instagram page. Can you can you repeat that again? Yeah, it's uh, sherelf.ca is the website. Sherel, how do you spell that? Sure, Sherelf. It's S H E R. Oh, sure okay. Yeah, so we have that, and we have uh, again a Facebook group as well, and a Facebook page uh, that my wife monitors a lot of this stuff, so. She's a star of this. Most of online stuff that is is posted, mm -hmm. I'll curate it. But she does a lot of the work, and and she's a blessing. Yeah, good for you. Is she is she doing carnivore too, or or something closer? She's doing a form of it. She's uh, most days carnivore, other days keto, but for the most part, it's it's carnivore. She likes. She's a Filipina, right? So she's grew grew up around a lot of yeah. uh, cultural aspects that are very food focused. Uh huh. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's just like food. Every time you, every time you go visit somebody, all the food comes out, and it's all day long eating type of stuff. I think. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Similar when I visited Malaysia. I think it was. Yeah, you know, they were talking about it. it's just food for every every. You know, it's like you got to do it all the time. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Travis. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing uh, your story here. I wish you continued success and with, with all the ventures coming up. And, I, and I, I'm always happy to see people continue to share this uh, so that we can, you know, we can change, you know, the world, hopefully, for the, for the better. Uh, for the rest of you guys, we have another one of these at 4 p.m. today. If anyone is interested, we have another, another interview I'm doing this afternoon. So if anyone wants to be there, that would be great. Otherwise, um, we'll see everybody else tomorrow. Uh, Travis, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, guys. See, you some, see some of you guys at 4 p.m. Bye-bye, everybody. Hey, folks, it's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, well, you can 
become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful, and we'd love to see your success.